I'm about to fact check Ryan Humiston on his best bicep training advice. Welcome back, Dr. Milo Wolf here, PhD in sports science, and I wanted to react to a video by Ryan Humiston. It recently popped up in my recommendations, and some of the stuff he seemed to be saying is very interesting from a sports science perspective. In fact, it's something we've been researching quite a bit recently. So, without further ado, let's get into it. Suspense right now, it's peaking. They don't know what's about to hit them. What is he gonna talk about? What on earth could he possibly say next? Length and partials, maybe, or long muscle lengths. It won't be short and partials, cause that don't make sense. Length and partials. Length and partials or my life. Today we're using the EMG machine to test different bicep exercises. Why is that important? Why should you even care? Well, have you ever done a crossbody hammer curl? Most people do these for the brachialis. Turns out it's actually a horrible exercise for the brachialis. Partially because every time I do them, I end up running into my overly developed chest, but also because when I tested it with the EMG machine, I ended up getting more activation of the long head and short head. We're gonna go over all the exercises you've been basically wasting your time with, and it will blow your f***ing mind. All right, lads, we've got a problem here already. Why the random cleavage shot? I'm not 12. I, I can keep the attention on the video without the cleavage shot. And I've been seeing a lot of this recently, not just from Ryan, but also people like Squat University. It's, it's odd. I understand why you're doing it, but I, I don't think it's a good thing. Secondly, we're barely 30 seconds into the video, but EMG should not be used as a means to determine what exercise is better than another for hypertrophy. There's been several review papers on the exact topic. Let me speak first on a review paper by Vygotsky and colleagues from 2022 on exactly surface EMG, and how it's supposed to predict hypertrophy. Surface EMG ultimately measures neuromuscular excitation, essentially the amplitude of the electrical signal being sent to your muscle. However, it's important to note just how many logical jumps are involved in drawing the link between surface EMG as a strong predictor of hypertrophy. First, it is assumed that neuromuscular excitation as measured by surface EMG is tightly correlated with muscle activation, which then is tightly correlated with cross bridging of actin and myosin, which then obviously leads to high degree of force production, which then would predict hypertrophy. Now you'll notice that there's a number of assumptions baked in here. And putting aside all this theoretical mumbo jumbo as to why surface EMG is not the best way to assess which exercise best for hypertrophy, we do have direct tests of this. For instance, a study by Plotkin and colleagues measured EMG of a variety of muscles during the squat and the hip thrust exercise in different areas of the glutes, for example. And then they had participants actually do just the squat or just the hip thrust. And then they wanted to see whether the readings in surface EMG at baseline, for example, which exercise caused greater activation in certain areas of the glute, or which individuals tended to experience the greatest EMG, whether those things would predict actual muscle growth over time from the squat and hip thrust. And basically, surface EMG didn't predict hypertrophy in any way, shape, or form. And so look, I'm all for people investing into equipment as a means to make more scientific content, but we need to G-check ourselves a little bit when it comes to this sort of stuff. Because specifically with surface EMG, yeah, it's relatively cheap, like it's 10, 15K for an influencer like myself, hashtag social media PhD, that is not that much money. And it can be very attractive to think, I'm gonna invest in this and it's gonna give me great conclusions about this exercise is what you need to do. And as you put in the introduction, this one is wasting your gains. But in truth, surface EMG is not a tool I can tell you this whatsoever. But let's carry on. For example, it's common knowledge that incline curl hits more long head because you're putting it in a stretch position. The fact that it crosses over shoulder, elbow joint, short head brachialis, only cross over the elbow joint, it makes sense. That is not what happened. Real quick, there is some evidence now suggesting that the short head also crosses the shoulder joint. This is more recent evidence. I'm not even sure that it was published at the time of this video, but it's just worth noting that it's not just a long head of the biceps, but gets more stretched out during an incline curl. And additionally, since the brachialis and the brachioradialis serve as elbow flexors, there's a good chance that they'll get a good stimulus, whether you're doing an incline curl, whether you're doing more of a preacher curl, as long as you're performing elbow flexion with some caveats, they will be trained effectively. Just because an exercise is a bit better for the biceps as well, or a bit worse for the biceps as well, doesn't mean it will be any better or worse for other muscle groups. Ultimately, your body isn't thinking, hmm, the biceps is being trained right now, let me go ahead and reduce training for the brachialis and brachioradialis. Instead, it's thinking, hmm, I need to be producing force right now to lift this weight and I'm gonna be using all the muscles I can get to perform that task to contribute as much as possible. Essentially, it's an all hands on deck approach potentially. So while I do think certain exercises tend to be better than others, for example, we have a study by Zabaleta Cordy and colleagues comparing the preacher curl to the incline curl, finding better bicep hypertrophy from the preacher curl, essentially an exercise that places plenty of tension on the biceps 
in the stretch. While we have those studies, just because one muscle is being trained more effectively doesn't mean other muscles that also contribute to the same joint action or being trained less effectively. Turns out it's a battle between your brachialis and your short head to see which one can generate the most force. Really? What the fuck? My first thought is there's no way this machine's accurate. I can't be the first douchebag to spend his money on a machine like this with a superficial goal of hypertrophy and test this and figure this out. Something's wrong. Because otherwise my entire training career has been a fucking lie. Seriously, Google how to train a long head. One of the first results is always an inclined dumbbell curl. And I tested it. I tested every single angle you could use on the bench. I tested the cable variation. I even had an overly muscular woman come in and verify my results. And it sucks. And this racked my brain. I, it doesn't make sense. Enough. I am a minute and a half into this video. The people who have watched this, the 1.5 million people, have come away from it with entirely the wrong idea now. And that's not good. And even the language being used, like, I've wasted my training career, and that sort of thing. Brother, you did not waste your training career. Putting aside EMG even being a good tool for predicting hypertrophy, it is very unlikely that small differences will completely negate any hypertrophy you could have seen. Are you performing a function of the target muscle? Is it being trained pretty close to failure? Yes, that is going to be most of what makes an exercise effective. So no, these EMG readings do not just overrule everything else. And in fact, based on the paper I mentioned earlier, they probably shouldn't overrule anything. It doesn't make sense. It should work. You're putting that bicep in a stretch position, long head. It wasn't until I found this case study that I finally understood how dumb we all are. It has been done before, and they found the same exact thing. The reason they said the incline dumbbell curl was poor in terms of long head activation is because it stretches it beyond the optimal length, leading to inefficient actin myosin coupling. Now, is the science perfect? No. In fact, someone made an adorable cartoon video explaining how imperfect it is, and there's some things I agree with, but some things I definitely don't. Why? Just because a muscle isn't operating at a plateau, or essentially the muscle length at which it is capable of producing the most force in its length tension relationship, doesn't mean it's not being trained effectively. The evidence for that claim is pretty weak. Unfortunately, Ryan seems to be misunderstanding a lot of the science. This device doesn't actually measure muscle activation, it measures neuromuscular excitation. But this is, without a doubt, the best tool we have in regards to measurement. To discard this is to discredit tens of thousands of studies and assume there's some sort of dysfunction between the signal being sent and the muscle actually contracting. I can't control whether or not you took your Flintstone vitamins and now your sodium potassium pump is off. And the reason I chose this exact machine is how precise it is. You can actually measure the different levels of excitability throughout the same muscle. Why is that important? Because not all exercises are created equal and most will generate different levels of torque throughout the muscle at various points through the range of motion, therefore exciting those nerve cells that are throughout your muscle with varying levels of intensity. Oh man, at least he's aware of the research, but I think what he's not aware of is that to my knowledge, basically no empirical studies have really supported the idea that surface EMG will actually predict hypertrophy. I know it's tempting to just think that surface EMG you know, you slap some electrodes on your muscle and you measure surface amplitude and all of a sudden you know what's better for hypertrophy. That's really tempting because then we don't need studies comparing different exercises and measuring hypertrophy. We don't need all the muscle length research. Do you have an EMG machine? Congratulations. You can figure out what works best for you, dear viewer. Unfortunately, that's just not how it works. It just isn't. Look, I'm very open to be wrong on this and maybe more science comes out or maybe I've overlooked some science on the topic, but damn. I don't think this tool can be used in this way, as tempting as it is. Towards the bottom and the top. This is the sensor placed at the bottom. This one is the one placed at the top. When I did a supinated bicep curl, I got a greater response and potentially greater contractile force out of the fibers at the lower end of my short head. But when I did concentration curls, I actually created a greater response and would potentially generate a greater contractile force in those fibers at the proximal end. Now, does this mean you should go knock on the door of everybody who said that concentration curls are a bad exercise and put your shiny little tea bag on their forehead? Maybe. What it tells me more than anything else is that exercise variability is critical. If you don't know what to do, do a lot of things. Especially when you consider the fact that I did several of these tests. On this particular one, I did the supination curl and then went right into the concentration curl. And even with fatigue factored in, I got more activation out of the upper end, that proximal end of my short head. A few things. One, I really don't like this N equals one bullshit at the moment. Like this doesn't tell us anything. There's a reason why in studies we have a lot of participants over longer timeframes, typically measuring hypertrophy and not just surface EMG, 
as a predictor of hypertrophy. There's a reason why we need several participants, in fact, typically several studies, sometimes a dozen studies or more, to really start arriving at relatively robust conclusions of there being a true effect we're measuring, of something truly being better than something else. So no, I don't like these pop science videos where it's like n equals one and trying to tell you how to train based on his own experience with his EMG unit. But I do agree with him saying you should probably use a variety of exercises. Look, you can definitely go overboard. I don't think you need to be doing four or more exercises for most muscle groups per week. But some evidence we do have suggests that using a variety of exercises to train a muscle typically results in more uniform or better overall hypertrophy compared to just sticking to one. And specifically with muscles that are a bit more complex, like the back, where there's a lot of different muscle groups, a lot of different functions in both the shoulder joint and the scapula, for those muscles, having at least two to three exercises in there per week is going to be beneficial in all likelihood. Another argument that drove me crazy that I saw a lot of people making is they said that incline curls were actually a great exercise in spite of the fact they put your long head at a disadvantage. It's because you're not factoring in passive tension. In layman's terms, it's when you stretch. You know the shit you did in elementary school PE class when you cross one leg over the other and you leaned forward and you gotta whiff your own balls? That's the building blocks of an incredible exercise. Now this is where we're gonna blow out the O-ring of that theory. Now I am a fan of weighted stretches. In the last full gym program I just put out, the end of every back and chest day, we ended it with a 60 second extreme stretch under load. But they can't be the foundation of your training. If that was the case, then you would just sit on the incline bench, grab a heavy ass weight and lower it for 10 minutes straight and then hold that stretch. The goal is active tension. That's what the fuck we're doing. When you think of high cable curls, you think short head activation, which is true when your elbows are forward. But the moment you exaggerate that external rotation and put that long head on stretch, but not to the point it actually inhibits activation like it does with the incline curl, you've now, based upon EMG data, got the most activation out of your long head and have that passive stretch that everybody seems to be in love with. So for me, this exercise, based upon all the testing I've done, is the best exercise for your long head. So go fuck yourself. In keeping with a strong language display to have, I think he's conflating EMG and active tension being produced. Again, this just seems like a very pop science way of looking at things, where he's thinking surface EMG will perfectly predict and correlate with active tension being produced by a given muscle. There's a lot of things that can go wrong with electrode placement during surface EMG. There's some assumptions baked into the link between surface EMG and active tension production. So no, he is being a reductionist and oversimplifying things where it's not warranted to do so. Now let's go over what I found to be the best exercise for targeting your brachialis. And just so we're clear and you understand why I picked this exercise, in my opinion, if your goal is to build muscle, then you should be trying to isolate down to whatever muscle you're targeting as much as humanly possible. This machine made me realize exactly how hard it is to do that. All right, I agree on principle with that. I think that isolating a muscle through only performing its function, for example, if you're trying to train your biceps and you can do either a pull down or a row or a bicep curl, which is going to be better, all else being equal. While the one that only has you performing elbow flexion, there's fewer moving parts and fewer other muscle groups that could give up first. But importantly, it looks like he's about to go too far with this, where he's gonna say, well, actually, just isolating elbow flexion isn't enough to really target the bicep's long head or the brachialis. And additionally, it looks like he's about to base it off of surface EMG, which, again. Previously, I thought it was as simple as just rotating your wrist. You wanna hit more short head, you take a supinated grip. Long head's neutral, pronated hits more brachialis. But it turns out it's a lot more complicated than that because you also have to factor in internal and external rotation of your shoulder as well as the position of your body in relation to gravity. So good luck. But you can definitely do it, especially when you're trying to target your brachialis. When you take a pronated grip and do a concentration curl, it almost completely turns off the activation to your long and short head and the brachialis is the primary driver of the movement. And I always thought that reverse grip straight bar curls were predominantly brachialis, not the case. Apparently your body's like, oh shit, homie just turned his wrist. Guess I'll turn off the biceps and break your radialis entirely. Let me just use my brachialis for elbow flexion. Again, it's super unlikely this is what's happening. And shit, if you want an example of EMG going quite wrong, you can also look at a series of articles by the well-intentioned and super knowledgeable Brett Contreras back in like 2017 for T-Nation, where he measured EMG of a variety of muscles across a variety of exercises. And I'm pretty sure at the time, if I'm recalling correctly, the highest EMG for the quads, and so presumably the best exercise for the quads in the legs, was the hip thrust. I'm not sure I've ever seen anyone claim properly that the hip thrust is the best quad exercise. But that's what Ryan's doing here, basically. Because those shoulders are internally rotated and you have a pronated grip, you end up inhibiting that short head. And because you're curling up on a path that is directly in line with your long head, 
This actually, based on all the tests I've done so far, ends up being the second best exercise I've found for your long head. So to recap, the best way to really isolate down and target your brachialis is by pairing the pronation of your wrist with the internal rotation of your shoulder. So exercises like a concentration curl with a pronated grip or that same grip with a cross body cable curl with your arm fixed against the machines. Background looks like I died. In my attempt to try to isolate the short head, I started to realize what finicky little pieces of shit those bicep muscles are because they're all trying to work in unison to do the same job, so you really have to manipulate your form. For example, the best exercise I found is when I jammed my arm up to a bench that was on a steep incline and did dumbbell curls. But I also had to make sure the elbow was slightly in front of me, and I put that shoulder in external rotation because the moment I turned back in, I got more long head activation. And it had to be a supinated grip because the moment I started screwing with my wrist, weird shit would happen. Also, the support and angle of this bench matters because if you try to do it just standing in place, the other bicep muscles jump in and ruin your life. Now, there's still so much we can cover just with biceps alone, but I'm gonna leave it up to you guys. If you think this is interesting and it adds value, we'll keep going. If you don't like what amounts to the homeschooled version of scientific training, yeah, I'd have to fall into the category of not really enjoying this home science, homeschool science content or whatever he calls it. This just feels like a wrong and pop science approach to how to predict what exercises are good for hypertrophy. Because again, there are no real empirical findings to my knowledge strongly substantiating the idea that EMG will predict hypertrophy across different exercises. And by the way, there's a reason why in universities and in actual studies, people need training before being able to use surface EMG properly in the first place. The same goes for measuring muscle thickness by ultrasound, for example. It's not something that you can just do right the first time around as a consumer. So there's just a number of issues with the way he's using surface EMG here. And by the way, none of this is meant as a slight on Ryan Humiston. A lot of this content is actually fine. I just don't agree pretty much whatsoever with the claims made in this video. Overall, based on just this video, I'd have to give it like a, a two or a three out of 10. It's just not good. Like the claims being made are scientifically very difficult to defend. But hey, as far as making content goes, I think that having a sort of CMG machine, is essentially a free content mill, right? Because you can hook them up to your own muscles, do a variety of exercises, and then find stuff that isn't even there. You can find that one exercise is better than the other, but it isn't. But you can still make a video about it, and to the relatively uninformed lay public, it might seem pretty believable. So yeah, I have no doubt that the intentions were probably good, but I think the information is ultimately bad. That is the video. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, comment, subscribe, soften the suffering I just had to endure. If you want to get a coach, but coaches are expensive, check out myoadapt.com. It's a training app I've been developing for years that'll come at a much lower price point than basically any coach out there. But it uses the latest scientific research, providing you with an individualized training program based on your preferences as far as what muscle groups you want to bring up. Oh, you want to grow your chest, but your legs are already pretty big? It can account for that and make sure that you're specializing on your chest. Let's say you only have an hour to train a week. MyoAdapt will also cover you in that case. What's that? You only want to train on Mondays and Tuesdays? MyoAdapt can cover you on that as well. MyoAdapt is a super flexible training tool. It is literally designed to be like a coach in your pocket. So if you go to myoadapt.com and sign up to be notified when it gets released, you'll be the first one to know and you'll be able to lock in at a lower price than any other time. If you're like, Dr. Milo, I like the t-shirt. Why yes, that is Atlas carrying a world or whatever it is on his back. And yes, it is a very cool t-shirt. If you like the t-shirt, go check out rascalapparel.com. Using code WOLF, you'll get 10% off at checkout. And you'll be supporting your boy as well. Finally, if in the meantime, you'd like me to coach you, check out the link above and I could become your coach. In the meantime, have a fantastic day and I will see you guys next time. Peace.